from MTN, the Montana Television Network. This is Face the State. Good morning and welcome to Face the State here on the Montana Television Network. I'm Jay Cohn, your host today. Thanks for joining us. Hope your week is off to a good start here on this Memorial Day weekend. And we have, a, uh, as you see, a studio full of guests today, all here to talk about a, uh, uh, a good topic for Memorial Day weekend. <laughs> We're talking about the management of the Bighorn River this morning, along with the management of Bighorn Lake and the Yellowtail Dam. Let's introduce you to our guests right away. Next to me here on the uh, desk, we have uh, Steve Davies, the area manager for the Bureau of Reclamation. Steve has 32 years with the Bureau of Rec, and as the area manager, he's focused on Montana. Steve, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll have much more from the Bureau of Rec in just a moment, but thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jay. In the middle, we have uh, Justin Hosfeld. Uh, Hosfeld, I'm sorry, Justin. Okay. He is the president of the Sunlight Ranches down <coughs> along the Bighorn River. He's here uh, as a representative of the Bighorn River Alliance, one of the groups, uh, one of the stakeholders involved with the, the question of the management of this river and the lake. Justin has been uh, the president of the Sunlight Ranches since 2007. Thanks for joining us, Justin. Thank you for the opportunity. And last but certainly <coughs> not least on the end, we have Ken Grant uh, from Lovell, Wyoming. He is with the Friends of Bighorn Lake. Ken also a auto and car dealer, along with RVs and boats of Midway Auto Sales down in the Lovell area, and has driven up uh, today to join us to <coughs> discuss this important issue for Montana and Wyoming. Ken, thanks for joining us. Good to be here. Steve, let's talk a little bit about the Bureau of Reclamation People I'm not sure really understand how big and important this uh, federal agency is. The largest wholesale water supplier in the western U.S., the nation's second largest producer of hydropower. And you say uh, managing all these dams and these water districts or water projects in Montana quite the challenge. It's incredibly ja challenging, Jay, and thanks for the opportunity to talk today. I'm the manager of the Montana Area Office. Yellowtail Dam is just one of 12 facilities, storage reservoirs that are within my purview of Montana. Uh, it's probably the most complex though. It's a large dam, 525 feet high. It was authorized in the 1940s, built in the 1960s quite some time ago, but that's pretty new by, our, by reclamation right. standards in the Western United States. It has an incredibly diverse amount of stakeholders that, that are interested in the Yellowtail in addition to the Friends of the Bighorn Lake and, in, and for the Bighorn River. We have the National Park Service. It's a Bighorn Canyon National Recreation Area. The Crow Tribe play is a major player with the water in Yellowtail Dam. It, co it crosses two states with Wyoming and Montana. It backs up a reservoir almost 70 miles long, and when it's full, it's, it's almost 500 feet deep. It stores a, lot of res uh, stores a lot of water. It has a large power plant associated with it, and we have the un unenviable task, <laughs> I think, sometimes of being caught between a lot of the stakeholders trying to provide a balanced operation to meet everybody's needs, and those needs are often competing with one another. So sometimes our decisions are, are, are good for one, but not as good for the other, and sometimes it's vice versa. So it's quite challenging uh, operation at Yellowtail Dam. I can imagine. And these days at the mercy of Mother Nature, <coughs> and whether it's a drought year or a record water year like we're perhaps experiencing now, uh, more on that to come, but Steve, thanks for being here. Looking forward to your perspective. Yep. Justin, tell us about the Bighorn River Alliance. You say you're really not a member of the Bighorn River Alliance, but uh, as a uh, president of the Sunlight Ranches, you're definitely uh, one of the stakeholders here. Tell us your representation with that group and uh, your interests here today. You're right. Well, <coughs> our interests are not only, we, we certainly understand Mr. Davies' situation being partnered with Mother Nature because many of us are partnered right. with Mother Nature in our ag operations and, and and we know that the river is an integral part of both upstream and downstream as the landscape of as the river operates. So so as you mentioned I'm here to, to speak on behalf of the Bighorn River Alliance and, and and their their concerns and their hopes for for collaborative efforts and a collaborative results on the river but also the ag, the ag community and other just landowners and stakeholders including the, 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 power, the power facilities and the communication facilities in the area. Tell us a little bit about the Sunlight Ranches. Uh, you say it, it extends into Montana and Wyoming. Yes, Sunlight Ranches is, is, a, is a large farming operation, family-owned farming operation that operates in Montana and Wyoming. We have a cow-calf operation, we have yearling operation, we have feedlots, and a substantial farming operation. I, our, our goals are to, to be to be a good, a good member of the ag community and, and to be good stewards of the land and partners with, with federal agencies and other, other operations. Ken, tell us a little bit about the Friends of Bighorn Lake. <coughs> You've been uh, on the board since it was founded in 2007. 
Yes. Um, initially, during the drought years from 2000 to 2006, uh, the reservoir on the south end of the, or the lake on the south end of the reservoir was dry. And we were quite uneducated. We assumed uh, that it w just wasn't enough water. And there wasn't enough water. It was, <coughs> it was a drought. Um, in 2005, spring of 2005, there was a lot of spring rains that filled the reservoir unexpectedly. And so we thought, hey, the water's back, the reservoir's back, we're good to go. Uh, this is before I sold boats. I ordered a new boat, and by spring of 2006, when my boat came in, the reservoir was dry again. They had drained the whole thing down. And that really got us thinking, what's going on with this water? And so we started diving into the logistics of how the reservoir was managed, and we found that the Bureau of Reclamation was working very close with my Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and they were recommending flows for the river. Nobody was recommending lake levels. It was, it was being ignored. And uh, we, didn't, we didn't understand we needed to uh, keep advocate an eye on things. Yeah. Uh, we learned that we did need to advocate for it. And we studied. We found out what the standard operating procedures of the Bureau of Rec was. And we found that they weren't necessarily following all their procedures and ignoring the lake levels and ignoring the National Park Service and what they needed so that there could be recreation on the south end of the lake. So we formed the Friends of Bighorn Lake, uh, got a lot of members uh, involved. So we represent uh, local economies in Wyoming. We re represent boaters from My Wyoming, from Montana, that like to boat and recreate on the reservoir. Well, it's interesting. You know, Mark Twain said, whiskey's for drinking waters we're fighting <laughs> over. And uh, you'd think uh, this great resource that we could come to a meeting of the minds. But as you can see, just in our brief introductions here, all the different uh, interests at play. Steve, uh, it seems like 2008 is the uh, moment in time where, where people, at least the Alliance, is saying the management practices of uh, the managing the uh, reservoir changed. Is that, is that the case? And maybe tell us how that happened. That's essentially true, Jay. You know, we went through an incredible period from 2000 to about 2007 and 8, where there was a really bad drought period. Yes, we um, remember. Yeah. yeah, the reservoir did not fill. We had really low lake levels. We had really low river levels. Nobody was happy. And so advocates for both sides came together and said, hey, we're not happy with reclamations management. What can we do to get better at this? And over about a two to three year period, we worked with stakeholders to develop criteria that tried to recognize the interests of all stakeholders. Uh, that resulted in the implementation of some criteria in 2010. Uh, for the 2010 operating year that said, okay, can we get better at managing reservoir levels a little differently to help the people up uh, on the upper end of the reservoir? And can we avoid, it? in particular at the time, some of the really low river levels? We were down very low on the river uh, for a long time. Is there something we could do to improve upon both of those? That was really the driver, and it brought a lot of stakeholders together. That started out very contentious. And over the course of probably two to three years, it really became a collaboration of understanding in terms of what the lake, uh, how it's operated, how the river is operated, how do we manage, what are we looking at? And it really brought a lot of transparency to the table that I think uh, educated a lot of people in terms of what's going on at Yellowtail. I think a lot of people remember those, uh, those down years where the, not just the, uh, the boat ramp on the other end was dry, but the uh, facilities on this end were dry. And I remember we did some stories here in MTN about because the uh, Yellowtail Dam was at least regulating some of the flow in the, in the Bighorn River, we went down there because all the other rivers in Montana were going dry and everyone was flocking to the Bighorn for the few fishing opportunities that were left. So uh, the fisheries uh, biologist told me at the time, if they can fill that river bank to bank, it's going to fill with fish. And that's all directly related to, to water levels. So if you just flash back to those years when we were so dry, and now compare it to now, because we've had <coughs> two of the most of the wettest years on record just within the recent memory. It's amazing how it's changed since 2010. Just flipped overnight. We went through seven, eight years of absolute, uh, really bad drought. And since 2010, we've, had, we've established two all-time record inflows in 2011 and again last year. Uh, we had to go all the way back to 1967, or 51 years before we saw the types of inflows that we saw in 2011 and again in 2017. And so we've really experienced over the last eight water seasons uh, a really an up and down. Two years were uh, about half what would be normal, kind of almost the drought year. But the other five were, were almost phenomenal in terms of the amount of water that was generated. And that really presents a lot of challenges for water managers to react to that. Uh, you know, our biggest challenge that we have 
is forecasting what we think we're going to get for an inflow, and then when is that going to come? Uh, you know, that, that comes from a lot of different agencies, not just reclamation. Mm -hmm. The Weather Service plays a big part in that. Natural Resource Conservation Service does. The Corps of Engineer does. Uh, the USGS. Everybody's looking at how can we get better at, at forecasting. So we're utilizing that, a lot of that information, but at the end of the day, it's kind of like the weatherman, you know, what, <laughs> is it going to rain next week? You know, they, we don't have a lot of confidence in really what's going to happen next week. And so we have a really, we, we present a wide range of operations, and, and I think stakeholders would like to get that narrow in, just tell us it's going to be this. When we say, we're probably going to be somewhere like that. I see. Yeah. You don't have a direct conduit to uh, Mother Nature. She doesn't yeah. clue you in exactly what to expect. <laughs> how, how accurate are those projections? Uh, you say you try to try yeah. to project the, the inflow over the years. Uh, have they been even in the ballpark? Well, what we like to say is when we put a forecast on paper, we know it's going to be wrong. It's going to be higher, <laughs> yeah, whatever it's going to be higher, or it's going to be lower. Some years are really close. Some years are really off. And we get these uh, in, in terms of what we're expecting, what our expected inflow is going to be. But, uh, but again, we, we put a wide range of flows. We, we're going to put a really high flow and a really low flow to kind of put the borders on what we think is going to happen. And hopefully we're going to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, often we're not. We're outside of that with some big storms or some other event right. that's ha that happens. Justin, we were talking, we're not sure. Everyone wants to say compared to normal, <laughs> what is normal these days? We're not, no one really can yeah. put their finger on it. Tell me though, uh, since they changed the management criteria in 2008, <coughs> uh, folks downstream feel that's been very bad for not only agriculture, but the municipalities, the, the fishery. Uh, those are your main concerns. Uh, you feel that those new, that new criteria is not working at least, uh, at least fairly for your half. Well, yeah, and, and, and as, we, as we, Steve <coughs> just got through saying, and as we've been saying all through the conversation, we've been dealing with some high water years that that have, that have been making that challenging to necessarily put your finger on exactly what the results and the, and the operating criteria have been. So we, we, we certainly, uh, you know, Steve, as Steve mentioned, he has the unenvious job of, of, of sitting there trying to do that, and we don't envy his job. And, and, and I want, you know, we want everyone to know that we certainly appreciate that hindsight's twenty twenty, and no one's crystal ball is that good. But, but as we sit and, you know, as we look at, 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 at the operations and at the downstream effects since that change in, my, in, in management or operating criteria, we do feel we're starting to see a trend in, in, in erosion or in releases that, that, are, that, that seem higher than they, than they should be. And, and, and given understanding that in the record water years, no one is being critical of, of those releases, just knowing that <coughs> you, you have to do what you have to do to work that water through the system. But, but as we've made the analysis, as we've looked through it, and as we've removed the high water years, we still see, feel that we see a trend of, of, of higher flows and flows probably that the river is unaccustomed to. We, you know, and, and I can appreciate, I, I, we certainly appreciate the, the Friends of Bighorn Lake and the upper end of the, of the, of the lake and, and how those years of drought tend to, to make you think that, you know, the, that we're in this never-ending situation where where has the lake gone and 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 and, and uh, if the ag community manages a lot of dams and reservoirs themselves for mm -hmm. livestock water for irrigation and we know the old <coughs> axiom in, in reservoir management that you can't make water and so when you go through yeah. so when you go through a long period of drought th it creates an instinct within you to 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 be to hoard that water to to try and make that water by by keeping that water back and so i i think our, our one of our biggest asks, and, and, and the Bureau this year has been really great to, to, open, up, to open up their operations. They've created a technical group that's, that's really delving into, into the criteria to look at these concerns that we've brought forward to, to see that, that maybe some of, this, some, of this, some of the storage in the dam has gone away from this instinct that you can't create water. Uh -huh. And, and, and then we're, we're just asking that we look to see if we don't have a trend that has swung the other way. We certainly appreciate that that, that what, what was going on before needed, needed to be addressed, that was the pendulum swung one direction. Now we're wondering if this pendulum hasn't swung a little, little too you know, far to the other direction. And, to, to, and, and we're just asking to see if we can't find a greater level of compromise. Ken, your perspective after, after hearing that, uh, the big culprit in all this is sedimentation and the sediment in the lake that's uh, filling up the Horseshoe Bend area <coughs> to the point where the, that recreational opportunities there really um, compromised. It is. There is a silt problem. <laughs> I think it is greatly exaggerated. Um, let me just say first of all that, that 
over this period, last 10 years or so, that the Bureau of Reclamation has been monitoring things more closely, trying to predict things more closely, <coughs> manage more fairly. Uh, despite the, the crazy inflow years, we feel they've done a remarkable job. It hasn't always been exactly what we wanted. Uh, there's been times where we've contacted the Bureau and it's like, well, why are you doing this? And they explain it to us and we just kind of grit our teeth and, and <laughs> deal with it. And the reason why we have dealt with it is because we felt like we were working as a team with all stakeholders and there needed to be some give and take. Now, honestly, we believe that the, the lake levels and recreation is a project purpose of the Bureau of Reclamation to take care of. We have not <coughs> found any documentation that shows that downstream river fishery is a project purpose. And I know Steve will dispute that, but we haven't seen those documents. We, we know that the project purposes originally was flood control, irrigation, silt control, hydroelectric power, and then in 1950, 62, 65, uh, it was put in for improvements for the for reservoir fishery, waterfowl, and recreation. Those were project purposes. Um, so we, so despite the fact that we don't believe the downstream ri river fishery is a project purpose, we're trying to work as a team, and we're watching this evolve over the years. And we're kind of okay with what's going on. The reservoir has filled. We've been able to have flat water <coughs> recreation, but then the beginning of this year, we're blindsided by the River Alliance's uh, media blast. The video they put out, uh, their news releases, they, they were full of propaganda and exaggerations and misinformation. That's the, the report, A River at Risk, correct? Yes, that came out yes. in January. It, we watched that video and were amazed at, at the exaggerations and, and what was talked about. You know, in, in one breath, they say how valuable the river fishery is. In the same sentence, they say the river's a risk. Uh, in 2005, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks estimated the value of the river economy at 14.25 million. Thirteen years later, they're saying it's worth 134 million. And it's climbed every year exponentially. Um, <coughs> most of the time, it was, the economic value was estimated by Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. In this river at risk and their new news blast that the River Alliance put out, it was estimated by themselves. And it jumps to 134 <coughs> million. In the same video, they're saying, why should we manage the reservoir for a lake that has no life? Talking about the silt. Right. Well, you know, we've had, in the last 10 years, our launch level has been 3617, which it used to be lower, but because the silt, it was put at 3617 over 10 years ago it's still 3617. It's not like this reservoir is just filling up and in five years, there won't be a horseshoe bend. It's not that case at all. Uh, there's a lot of life left in it. So it's kind of disingenuous for the River Alliance to say they're part of the team <coughs> and for us to want to compromise with them even though we don't believe they are a project purpose. And then they blindside us with a bunch of misinformation. We're like, where did that come from? You know, that, that's not teamwork. Are you, are you leaving the team? You know, they say they want fair management, but at the same time, they exaggerate their economic value and they devalue the lake. So, you know, it's, it's disingenuous and it's hard to deal with. Justin, so, your, your, your response. One thing I read that you said, and, <coughs> and you can respond to what he had, had to say there, but one of your complaints is that this new management criteria is kind of... Uh, remove the dam's ability to be a shock absorber for the good years and the bad years as far as water levels are concerned. You, yes, partly that is that storage has a direct relationship to releases. Mm -hmm. and, and that is one of the things that we've asked through, you know, through this technical group and through, through, through these new efforts by the Alliance and, and other members besides the Alliance is to look and see if, the, if these new goals, these new targets for the lake has, has eliminated storage for the releases. But, so, so that that I don't <coughs> know that necessarily, you know, everyone can take from 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 the campaign that they what what they see or what they feel. But I, I don't think that the campaign was necessarily meant to diminish the the recreation and and the lake's role on the upper end. It, it's more driven to to bring to light what what the new changes and what the activity that may be going on on the river. But and as far as the numbers that and. And the, and the information that came out in the report, 
those numbers, uh, those numbers, we were we were very careful to make sure we pulled them from Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, from Montana Revenue Services, using formulas and using data and information that they use to not only look at actual cash receipts, but the potential that that, that opportunity gives. But and th and that you know that speaks to the fishery and that speaks to re recreation, which was which is a huge part of that part uh, of that part of the county, but. But also, uh, along with that, and, and Ken, I think you'll agree, in, as part of that, as part of that uh, video where it came out, or that, that, the, the Alliance's you know, publication that they mm -hmm. put out, is, is the other stakeholders on the river. Agriculture, what the impact on agriculture might be, erosion, what the erosion <coughs> might be doing to the mis <coughs> municipalities and those things. So it's not only focused on, on necessarily just revenue versus revenue versus a, a one recreationist versus the other. It's the overall impact downstream and on the river in, in, in Bighorn County. And, and as far as, you know, we're happy, and, I, and I'm speaking the royal we, if you will, okay. being, being, right. and I'm sure everyone's cringing as I do it, but, but we're, we're happy to, to look at any numbers and amend the numbers that are in the report. It was never intended to be propaganda. It it's, was never intended to be malicious. The Alliance has no mil ill will against the Friends of Bighorn Lake. It was more just of a, an, an attempt to call to call attention to and scrutiny to these things that we're seeing going on. Well, we could argue over the figures. Uh, <coughs> it definitely got people's attention, and it's one reason we're here today is to try to uh, get more public education out there about the difficult issues at, at play. Steve, your reaction, because we got just a sense here of where these two sides uh, have their own interests and they're, they're trying to meet in the middle, but there's not a great deal of trust here. So our role is trying to meet with both and promote a collaborative conversation. So when the River at Risk came out, we, we looked at it, we didn't dive into the numbers. We would disagree as, uh, as others would with, with portions of that. But I think our role, what we did in November of 2017, even before that came out, what we were hearing from the Bighorn River Alliance is, hey, I think we've swung too far with this criteria. We're not happy. And what I've told uh, both groups and all groups in our public meetings is, hey, I've got a stakeholder that's saying they're not happy. Let's sit down and talk about that. So I committed in November and we initiated this in January of, hey, we put some criteria in place through a lot of effort from everybody at the table uh, over three years in 2006, 7, 8, 9 in that era. Um, do we need to do that again? Uh, we had some expectations when we put that together in terms of re re reservoir levels and river levels and power generation and things like that. And it, we had been in place for eight years, so it was time to ask ourselves, are we meeting what we thought mm -hmm. the original objectives were? And so we could do that in-house, and, and we are doing it, and we're, and we're involving stakeholders with this. Justin mentioned the, the technical working group. Uh, we've invited all stakeholders to have a member at the table for this so we can sit down and say we've got an unhappy stakeholder. Um, did we go too far? We're asking ourselves and that's the process that we're under, that, the, that we essentially we've undertaken right now with, with maybe some results uh, this November. We can report back on what's going on. We've had some pretty productive meetings with yeah. great participation. Yes. That's the kind of environment I think we all like to be in in terms Absolutely. of if somebody's not happy, what's not working, let's look at it. I think that's what Agreed. we're willing to do. Yeah. Agreed. Well, perhaps uh, when you set, the, set that group up and get that uh, uh, dialogue going, that trust factor can, can come back, Ken. Yeah, we've met three, uh, you know, three, four times now, and that's actually well underway. So it's, it's, it's progressing. The, when, the, when tru the trust factor is, is going to be a process. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, when, when they say the, the river fishery has essentially grown over 900% in economic value, during the exact same period, they say that it's being mismanaged. If I could mismanage my business to have a 900% increase in value, I would keep mismanaging it. Uh, there's just so many contradictions that it's difficult to trust. So, so we get these new meetings going. It's difficult to trust anything that's said after something like that. Um, Ken, Ken mentioned that uh, the big, uh, friends of Bighorn Lake don't believe that the fishery, the stream below, is part of the project uh, uh, model or whatever. <coughs> I don't think you can argue that they're intertwined and interconnected, but your reaction? Well, we believe uh, Fish and Wildlife Purposes was an original authorization along with recreation. Certainly when you look at the historical documents that Congress put in place in 1944, they expected uh, a really good river fishery and a really good lake fishery. 
and, they, and there's a lot of discussion in those documents about those. Flood control, power generation, and irrigation were certainly the major components. And like a lot of our dams, when they were authorized in these early days, they had no idea just how much recreation and fish and wildlife benefits, I think, would really become to develop. Mm -hmm. But we recognize it. We, uh, we try to, uh, from a river and reservoir, we believe everybody's on an equal footing and we're not going to play a, a favorite child, so to speak. So, so we differ on that, I think, in terms of whether we believe fish and wildlife recreation originally authorized, we believe they were. Yep. To, Go ahead, to address that, um, on page four, 40 of the definite plan report, it specifically says uh, <coughs> there is no specific requirement for the downstream fishery. Then in January, part of the, um, the news release, uh, the River Alliance repeated that exact same phrase, that they realized there is no specific legal requirement for the downstream fishery. So as, as a kind neighbor, yeah, we can manage for it and we can work together. Legally, we don't believe there is, legally they have a project purpose as part of the Yellowtail project. Sounds like some uh, legal work uh, and some uh, fees will be uh, down the road. Let's talk about moving forward. Steve, you've said you've set up this uh, technical group as you look forward. And as I re read, it says uh, um, there's always kind of a self-reflection are we managing this resource as efficiently as possible? So that's a healthy thing to be re reviewing that and to increase this dialogue has to be something on a positive note for the Bureau. Well, I think we should always be asking ourselves, are we doing as best we can modeling? Modeling and forecasting is something that's constantly evolving. We know there's vast improvements that could be done in that. We've put this, when the criteria was put in place, uh, it was not expected to be a one and done kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Let's try this. Uh, we think this criteria that was put in place is really just kind of fine-tuning how the reservoir was originally designed to be operating. So we're trying to find some sweet spots in here where, where everybody might be a little happier. And as we go forward into the future, uh, I see us continuing to revisit that uh, and, and trying to, as, as we get more knowledge, more capabilities, and more understanding of everybody's interests and needs, you know, maybe we can meet some of these along the way. And especially with all the new technology we have, we have to believe those forecasts are going to be a little more accurate. <laughs> Justin, as we move forward, just a uh, final thoughts for you. We've got about a minute and a half left Kay, in the show. I, one thing, I, just a quick, to, to get back to Ken's point, I, you know, as far as the numbers and whether the, 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 the value of the fishery grew 900% under mismanagement, that's not necessarily the intent there. It's more preservation. Right. It's more recognizing a trend, wanting to make that trend known and visible to everyone, and then make sure we're doing the best by things to do that. The other can be chalked up to inflation, it can be chalked up to, to tourism and how it changed its patterns, all the rest of that. So we can go on forever on that. But lastly, I just want to say, I, I, I want to again agree with Steve that, that, that it is a living document. We, we know, you know, we were told that, we understand that. We want to participate to help keep it a living document and doing our part to contribute to that living document and make sure that we're doing that. But, but, but again, that's not solely at our benefit and, and, and to totally disregard what, what, what goes on in Friends of Bighorn Lake. Hey, they, you know, they lake, a lot of times if we're, if we're drawing down the, 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 the reservoir to help on releases, it might delay the full lake fill by 20 or 30 days, but we want to see them get their lake as soon as they can, yet make sure that releases are reasonable in how they go. Ken, your final thoughts on this Memorial Day weekend when everyone wants to be on that reservoir well, enjoying it. Th there's a little bit of difference between the reservoir and the river as they're always going to have water flowing and they can always fish when that water's flowing. But when our lake becomes a dry lake bed, it's a switch that shuts off. They might have a dimmer that goes up and down and there are flows that are preferred that make fishing better. But on our end, it's either on or off. So when you delay a very short recreation season during the summer months by 20 or 30 days. That's a big deal. That's a huge deal. That impacts the economy greatly. I realize they have fishing guides, they have uh, t uh, fishing shops that rely on the economy as well. There's a lot of people that rely on it. Um, they've always got revenue coming in. There's always fishing going on. That's not the case. It, it's a light switch that just shuts off. So Good to point. fill back up is very important. I'm sorry we're out of time. I told you this was going to fly by. We'll yeah. have much more on this as this uh, dialogue continues and this new criteria and the new plan is formed over the next few months and years. Steve, Justin, Ken, thank you so much for joining us and hopefully we'll uh, meet again in a, in soon, uh, maybe in the next year, and get an update from you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Chair. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much for joining us here on Face the State. Have a great week.
You've been watching Face the State, a presentation of MTN, the Montana Television Network.